Hey everybody and welcome back to another video here at Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. Hope everybody's having a good week. Today we're going to be talking about um, some more advanced management strategies for pulmonary embolism or blood clot in the lung, particularly when we risk stratify patients into low, intermediate, high risk, also known as submassive, massive, um, how we risk stratify those patients and then what that means for treatment possibilities. So this is a more advanced uh, lecture on pulmonary embolism. We actually do have a pulmonary embolism basics, uh, kind of an overview uh, video out as well. So definitely check that out. We'll link that in the video description. For those of you new to this channel, this channel, Whiteboard Medicine, we are public health and medical education YouTube channel. Uh, we'd love for you to subscribe, hit the bell button. Got a whole bunch of videos out there. If we go to playlist too, uh, oh, you can see we kind of have a recent intravenous fluids uh, series that we came out with. But uh, under playlist, and we'll link this in the video description, uh, we have a lot of critical care and pulmonology videos, uh, which this uh, topic is a part of. So definitely check those out. We also have a high yield Patreon page where we post all the video outlines, um, as well as practice questions, ad free videos, and a lot more. Uh, that'll be linked in this video's description too. We're trying to buff that up, so we'd love for you to consider joining it. There's free membership and then also paid tiered membership. Uh, no further ado, quick 30 second break for the introduction. Don't go anywhere. We'll dive into the video right after. Hey everybody and welcome to Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking out the video. Here at Whiteboard Medicine, our goal is to create medical education content for all types of interested learners. That includes videos, practice questions, study resources, and much more. We would love for you to join our community by subscribing, hit that bell button. We're also working to build a high yield Patreon page. It's going to be full of practice questions, video outlines, notes, commercial free content, and much more. None of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer in its entirety before moving on. All right, thanks for sticking around. So pulmonary embolism management, low, intermediate, and high risk. So to understand this, you do need some basal level of understanding um, in terms of pulmonary embolism. We'd encourage you to look at our basics overview video. Uh, if some of this is confusing, definitely refer back to that as that will help uh, get you up to date. But when we diagnose a pulmonary embolism, we often um, put that patient into a category. And that category may be a low risk, it may be intermediate risk, and within intermediate risk, there's intermediate low risk and intermediate high risk, or it may be high risk. And you can see here that high risk is also known as massive. Intermediate risk is often categorized as submassive. And then low risk is just low risk. But the risk category that that patient is in can often drive some of our considerations and treatment approaches. And remember, none of this is intended to be medical advice. This is all opinion. Um, certainly do your own research on topics um, and don't take this at its word. Um, but what we wanted to talk about is how to categorize patients with pulmonary embolism, the clinical features that then categorizes them, as well as how that affects the treatment approach. So the first thing we're gonna do is talk about low risk. So low risk pulmonary embolism is someone who is hemodynamically stable and their PESI class. We talked in that previous video, PESI is the pulmonary embolism severity index. And this is a whole bunch of different features that then you add the points up to to help us understand the 30-day mortality. And low risk is often a PESI class of one or two. Um, and this suggests that that patient has a low risk of 30-day mortality, single digit percentage. But the real thing here that categorizes low risk is that the patient has no RV dysfunction or elevated troponin. And some people also put BNP or brain natriuretic peptide in here. So no elevated troponin or BNP. And you're gonna see this theme when we risk um, uh, stratify these patients. The question is always, do they have signs of RV strain or they, do they have elevated biomarkers? And the biomarkers we're talking about are most often troponin, and then um, depending on your institution, sometimes BNP as well. So this is usually trope and BNP, okay? And when we talk about RV strain, there's two different ways you can see it. You can see it on CT scan. So is there contrast reflux into the IVC? Is the RV dilated compared to the LV? Or you can see this on transthoracic echocardiogram, TTE, transthoracic echocardiogram. So 
This is usually the first thing we have is the CT scan and then the echo comes later. But the workup initially for these patients tends to be CT scan, troponin, and BNP. And we can often get the information we need with these three things. And then sometimes you get an echocardiogram to further elucidate RV strain, depending on what everything looks like. But someone with a low risk PE has no signs of RV dysfunction and has no elevated biomarkers. So no elevated troponin and no elevated BNP. In these low risk pulmonary emboli, the treatment approach is typically just anticoagulation. And these patients, sometimes you can even consider treating them as an outpatient without having to admit to them, although you certainly would have to make sure they were a low-risk PESI score, that the patient was dependable, didn't have risk of bleeding, was amenable, had a good PCP to follow up with. There's lots of stuff you got to have queued up to do this. And when you're anticoagulating people, um, the preferred anticoagulation at this point tends to be a DOAC. This stands for Direct Oral Anticoagulant, D-O-A-C, DOAC, Direct Oral Anticoagulant. And these are a Pixaban or Rivaroxaban, a Pixaban brand name. Eliquis, Rivaroxaban brand name, Xarelto, all right? The DOEX tend to be the preferred modality because you don't need any follow-up labs to track whether it's the INR's therapeutic like you do for Coumadin, um, also known as Warfarin. And um, if you can't take a DOEX, sometimes people are on heparin, low molecular weight heparin, or again, Warfarin. Um, if you're going to start someone on Warfarin, for pulmonary embolism, there is a recommendation that you bridge that patient and you bridge them with heparin. What this means is that warfarin takes a few days before it's therapeutic, right? With warfarin, you have to track the INR to try to make sure the INR gets to be therapeutic. And there's a short window that's supposed to say therapeutic, just FYI. There's a short window after you start warfarin where you actually have this pro-coagulant state before you then become anticoagulated. So when you start warfarin, there's a recommendation often to bridge with heparin because the heparin will make sure that you're anticoagulated while the warfarin is kind of procoagulant before it becomes an anticoagulant once you reach your therapeutic INR. So all this to say, just another reason why the preferred anticoagulation tends to be these DOACs. All right, so low risk pulmonary embolism is no RV dysfunction, no elevated biomarkers, and that is just anticoagulation. You can consider doing it as an outpatient. What about intermediate risk? Well, as you can see here, there's intermediate low risk and intermediate high risk. Intermediate low risk is another patient who is hemodynamically stable. The PESI class might be three or four, and then you might have mild RV dysfunction and normal biomarkers, or you might have normal RV function in elevated biomarkers, right? This is one or the other. So for instance, you could have an elevated troponin, but then normal RV dysfunction, or you could have mild RV dysfunction and a normal troponin. So it's one or the other, you don't have both. You don't have both RV dysfunction and elevated biomarkers, and that is low risk. It's gonna be different for high risk. High risk, you're gonna have both RV dysfunction and elevated biomarkers. But when you're intermediate low risk, you have one or the other. And intermediate low risk is really the treatment's the same as low risk, okay? You anticoagulate a patient, you should probably admit them to the hospital, um, but anticoagulation alone is usually enough. At times, people talk about thrombectomy, mechanical thrombectomy, which is where you go in through the blood vessel and try to suck that blood clot out, um, so mechanical thrombectomy. But really, for intermediate low risk, that's not a widely recommended plan unless you have a contraindication to anticoagulation. This is in contrast to intermediate high risk. So intermediate high risk is where you have both RV dysfunction and elevated biomarkers, right? Troponin or BNP, you have both. Whereas for intermediate low risk, you just had one or the other. For intermediate high risk, you have both, RV dysfunction and elevated biomarkers. Again, you usually have a higher PESI class, maybe four or five, like we talked about. 
But for intermediate high risk, this is where things really start to get interesting. Because of course you should be anticoagulated. And here it says again, DOAX, like apixaban and rivaroxaban, low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. Low molecular weight heparin being something like Lovenox, whereas unfractionated heparin is like a heparin drip or infusion. But this is where mechanical thrombectomy seems to be growing in its use. Um, or, and this is maybe less used, but or catheter directed thrombolysis. Catheter directed thrombolysis is also, oh, we already wrote it below. Well, we're now, now we're rewriting it. Also abbreviated CDT. So mechanical thrombectomy, like we talked about, is where they go in through the blood vessels and they try to suck that blood clot out. Catheter-directed thrombolysis is where they go through the blood vessels and they actually leave a catheter right by the blood vessel. And they kind of just sprinkle thrombo uh, thrombolytic drugs right on that blood clot in low volumes. So thrombectomy, mechanical thrombectomy, and catheter-directed thrombolysis seem to have the most research and evidence behind them for intermediate high-risk PE, okay? Now, if a patient is worsening who has intermediate high risk, there is some evidence to suggest that you could use systemic thrombolysis. That's TPA, right? And TPA dosing is something also debated. Uh, the active guideline recommendation is 100 milligrams, although a lot of people would say you don't need 100 milligrams. Maybe you need 50 milligrams. Um, some people go as low as 25 milligrams, although there's more evidence for 50, and then 100 is guideline. Um, again, not medical advice, just medical opinion. But if someone is intermediate high risk and they start getting worse, you should consider thrombolysis, TPA. And whether you use 100 or 50 is something that you'll have to do the research on and decide. Or maybe we'll come up with a video going over all the trials on this. But intermediate high risk is where the management strategies become interesting. Um, this is often some of the beauty of a PERT team, if you've ever heard of that. A lot of hospitals have them. It's pulmonary embolism response team. Usually involves an ICU doctor, maybe an interventional cardiologist, interventional radiologist, pulmonologist, uh, pulmonary hypertension specialist to all discuss these cases to see what would be best for a patient um, just because there are trials and there's going to be a lot more trials and if we were trying to predict the future which we're not there yet but we think probably mechanical thrombectomy is going to become more main um, kind of not first line necessarily but uh, more universally recommended uh, for a lot of these patients maybe even for intermediate low risk um, as well as intermediate high risk but um, these are all therapies that could potentially benefit a patient depending on the clinical circumstances, which is why sometimes this multidisciplinary discussion, such as a PERT team, um, can be helpful. That then gets us into high risk, also known as massive. And this is hemodynamic instability. This is a patient who is hypotensive, okay? They're in shock. They have RV dysfunction. They have elevated biomarkers. Maybe they even had cardiac arrest, severe hypoxemia, okay? These are the sickest of the sick, and these patients are so ill. Um, as an ICU doctor and intensivist, um, massive PEs are terrifying because these patients are so sick. They're often in right heart failure, cardiogenic shock, and they're so high risk to kind of have this spiral, or sorry, obstructive shock the spiral of RV failure, um, and a lot of them can die, right? This is a really serious, really, really severe illness, all right? So hypotension, hemodynamic instability is the hallmark of massive. And massive should get systemic thrombolysis, alteplase, so known as TPA. This is a clot buster drug. You give it intravenously. This says you can consider catheter-based or surgical thrombectomy um, if thrombolysis fails or is contraindicated because someone has a risk of bleeding, and you can. If you're going to do that, you know, there's other things you could try to do. VA ECMO. We've talked about ECMO on the channel before. Um, definitely check out our playlist on mechanical circulatory support. Um, sometimes you can do ECMO with surgical embolectomy, right? Maybe give TPA, and then you try mechanical thrombectomy. But all these patients who are massive, per guideline, should get TPA. They should get systemic thrombolysis. This is not without risk, right? When they look at this, about 10% of patients who get thrombolysis can have a systemic bleed. Uh, don't quote us on this, but it's something like a 
two, maybe two to 5% can get intracranial hemorrhage, ICH, intracranial hemorrhage. Um, so this is not a benign drug. There are real risks with this drug, but massive PEs, high-risk PEs are so severe, so significant um, that TPA is the guideline recommended therapy, and it is something you should give to these patients, assuming they don't have a firm contraindication. Um, firm contraindications tend to be bleeding, recent surgeries, um, all that kind of stuff. So that is some of the advanced management strategies for pulmonary embolism based on a patient's risk category. Uh, let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Um, we'll, again, link the video notes as well as practice questions on our Patreon page as well as the ad-free video, so definitely check that out. We'd love for you to join our Patreon community. Uh, and either way, stay well, keep learning. We'll see you next time.